How many old machines do you have out of interest? I don't know. <laughs> I have a few VAX stations. Um, I have a larger VAX, which was from a friend. Uh, I have another PDP-11, which is much smaller than this one. It's designed for controlling a robot arm in a Nokia plant, I think. PDP-11s are particularly interesting because it was the machine that Unix was developed on. And then probably also C after that, you know, they were building C on top of Unix. So it's, it's quite a, a historical machine, I think. This is a PDP-11-73 in a 23-plus chassis. I think it runs at about 14 megahertz. It has one megabyte of RAM. It's using this uh, SCSI 2SD adapter. Um, but at some point, I hope to get my 10 megabyte RLO2 drives, which are about this sort of size, but twice, twice the height. Um, they're not working at the moment. So. <laughs> are they hard disks? And is that? Yeah, they're removable platter disks. Um, so e each platter has 10 megabytes. Um, and you can switch the platters between each drive. It's kind of a, a mixture of, of two machines. I mean, it has RAM from one and, and a CPU from another, um, but probably around 1983. So it's one of the later PDP-11s. Uh, it doesn't have the toggle switches on the front, for example. So we can actually pull these cards out. I'm going to disconnect it from, from the mains. <laughs> Good plan. I think it should be fine anyway, but um, I will spin it around. I'll just remove these ribbon cables and then yeah, so we'll start from the bottom and then, but actually discuss them from the top. That's That's terrifying doing this. It looks pretty straightforward though, the system of connections and everything. Yeah, so actually what's going on in the back here is just, uh, it's just a bus. There's just cards connected together. In fact, you have to have a card in every slot if you want to use the slot below it. Traditionally, these would have been wire wrapped. I think on, on this machine, uh, it's, it's soldered. So it, this is kind of mass production PDP-11 as opposed to, to handmade. So this is the PDP-1173 processor. Um, one of these I think is floating point, any other one is just, just general arithmetic and you know, standard move memory kind of instructions. Most of the logic down here is just for communication with the bus, you know, getting the voltage levels right and, and things like that. This one has two serial ports and some status lights. It's called a multifunction board, so it actually has 128 kilobytes of RAM separate from those. It has these boot ROMs, so you, you don't have to type in assembly programs basically to, to boot from your disk. Um, and it also has some, some, sometimes a, some kind of real-time clock as well, which is useful for keep, keeping time and things like that. This is the first memory board. It's half a megabyte, and there's another one of those. One of the interesting things about these machines is that every device has been allocated a part of memory. And you actually configure the, the memory address of these boards by wire wrapping basically binary numbers onto so. the jumpers. In my early memories of PCs, mm. we used to use dip switches. Is that kind of the same sort of thing? It's a bit like that, but you end up wanting to connect a lot of uh, jumpers to different ones, and, and every board is different. So if you don't have the manual, you can ba basically never get them working. But a, a lot of the manuals for these machines have been archived, actually, which is great. Um, so the starting address of this is, is zero. It, it's, it, has, it has 128 kilobytes of memory on it, so it starts at zero. This one then starts at 128. This is a, a clever board. It, ha it does actually have dip switches. This PDP-11 is a complete Frankenstein of a machine, so... When we go to the Centre for Computing History and talk to Jason about some of the old machines, mm. it seems to be the case that they all are. I mean, these were functional things that were used, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were just... I mean, I, I bought this card separately off eBay. Um, it wasn't that cheap either, unfortunately, but uh, with, without it, I, I don't have a working disk which I could boot it up. Well, I have working disks for SCSI, but I also have, you know, an RLO2 controller and a tape controller, but I don't have these devices to actually boot, boot the machine from. So this one communicates with a disk. So I could plug a normal DEC SCSI drive into this. Um, by DEC, I mean Digital Equipment Corporation, the, pe the people who make this a machine or made it, they were sold to Compaq, actually. We can type in some basic programs in assembly. Well, actually, there's actually an octal. Um, and then once we get bored of doing that, because it's, it's a lot of work, uh, we can boot into Unix and maybe play some games and, and, and show you roughly how similar it is now to, to modern Linux and Unix. So I don't want to get those two cards muddled up. Shouldn't we have static wrist straps on at this stage? Probably. But um, the nice thing about these machines is you can usually fix them when you kill them. So it's just a bit hard. 
But that's, that's actually part of the fun of it. Um, if you just have it booting Unix, I mean, I can send email and... Where's the keyboard and all that sort of stuff? The keyboard is all the way over there. So this is actually kind of similar to what you would have um, in a company. You would have maybe 16 or so terminals hooked up to a single PDP-11. Um, and you would access them remotely because it was too expensive to put the hardware next to the terminal. So everyone would share a single machine, which I, I, is, it's kind of coming back now with cloud computing and things. So it's clearly a good model. So, <laughs> okay, so that's my virtual RZ23 driver. So. Oh, so that's, a, that's pretending to be the hard disk, is yeah. it? Yeah. It's actually designed for an Amiga. Power that back up. Um, I will reset it because I want it to be in a mode that we can type. There's a reset switch and that's just for, you know, basically hard resetting the machine. It goes back to, to its starting point. Uh, there's this halt one which actually suspends the machine and at this point you can use the ODT which is the online debugging tool to insert memory, adjust memory, look at memory, look at the register state and that's actually what we'll be typing in a program in to do something very simple in a moment. And then the last one is, is this auxiliary input, which I don't really know what it does. It, it, if I don't have it enabled, it won't boot Unix. I think it's some, time, some kind of clock that, that Unix and, and other operating systems require for keeping time of things. So we'll plug the serial back in. This would typically go on the back. Uh, it's actually the, the wrong back, but it also has Ethernet. You would have seen this kind of Ethernet port on the Sun, which Steve did a video about. So we've got an Ethernet port on here, some switches, some lights. Video connected, wanted to plug in the Let's go to our desk. So this is the online debugging tool, and from here you can you can kind of check the status of registers. Most of mine seem to be empty. You can insert values into memory and then you know go back and check them. So we just deposited four, for example, in address one thousand in, in Octal, and we can go back and see that, that that's been deposited. So on earlier PDP-11s, the, the Unibus machines, you would have had to do this with switches on the front, much like in the recent Altair video. Yeah, let's type this, this program in. All this program does is, is allow you to type and see the characters back on the screen. So normally if I, if I do this, it kind of works, but it's trying to do something in ODT, which is you know, causing an error. So we'll type this program in. Uh, I'll probably make a mistake and it'll take me a while to figure out what I typed in wrong. So control J is the line feed. If you press carriage return, it, it stops and goes back into, into normal mode. So this is 177.560. Then we have 105.710. Okay, I think I've entered the program. We can quickly check. So we got this one, this one. These are actually raw assembly instructions so expressed in Octal, so you could turn these into binary and see the move instructions. For example, this top line here I can show you is moving the address of the serial card or the serial port into register zero so it knows where to, to read and write from. So let's try and run this program. Ah, I think I have it in halt mode, so I have, to, I have to go back to the machine. So now I can actually type words. This is a bad keyboard. It's just a carriage return, so it actually takes you Back to the beginning of the line, there's no line feed. I, I think maybe I can press, yeah, I can press Control J. And now we have a, wow. we, if you connected this to a printer, you'd have a. You'd have a very expensive typewriter. A very expensive typewriter <laughs> in the day, yeah. So that's, yeah. So obviously this is, yeah, my, oh no, there we go. Okay, so the, the whole key isn't set up on here. So if I want to reset it and we can boot into Unix, I have to go back over uh, here and, on, and uh, reset the machine. It's the early days of computing. Okay. <laughs> That's all you have to do. I'm loading Unix off the SCSI to SD card emulator. I can press Control C here and it'll actually go into the bootloader so you can see a, a bunch of options. For example, I can boot off uh, RL01 or RL02, which is 5 megabytes and 10 megabytes respectively. RX02 is, is the half a megabyte floppy disk. They're 8 inches wide. The thing that we're booting from is DU0, which is uh, this MSCP, which stands for Mass Storage Control Protocol. And this came later in PDP-11's life and just really simplified the process of booting into an operating system. So we're onto DU0 here, which is the SCSI disk, which contains 2.11 BSD. There was Unix um, from AT&T or Bell Labs, and then there was a fork of that from Berkeley, um, which was called BSD. This version of BSD is actually from the 90s. It's kind of, I think it's taken like the networking parts of a later BSD and moved them into 2.10 or something. So this is 2.11 BSD, it's slightly improved. So this is the actual Unix bootloader once you get past the PDP-11 bootloader. 
and this is where it starts to take some time. It boots into single user mode first, so you don't have to log in, uh, and you just automatically root. And then once it's booted into that, you can, you can access it, and it will boot into multi-user mode. And you know, people can tell that into your machine. I actually wrote a web server for, for this machine as well. So when it's running at home, you can connect to it and see a picture of it running. It takes like three seconds to load the page. It doesn't matter what speed your internet is. It's, uh, ah, I think we need to, I haven't used it on this terminal before. There we go. Okay, so this is in single user mode. We can do an LS and we'll see the, the root of the file system, do things like disk usage to check the size. So this is in one kilobyte blocks, I think. It's very similar to modern Unix. We can go into the games folder. I think Sean's been wanting to have a look at Zork. Well, it's no secret that we've been doing a few films based around Ready Player One. One of the key plot points in the book is about the game Zork, which I believe was developed on a machine like this. So yeah, you have it here then. This is a variant of Zork, which seems to name various digital machines like the PDP-11 in it for some reason. So this is the kind of format of Zork. It's, it kind of tells you where you are, gives you a description of your environment, and you have to enter some commands, such as in this case, it says there's a small mailbox here, so we can try and open the mailbox. I haven't gotten very far through this game. So it says there's a leaflet inside the mailbox, so let's read the leaflet. And uh, I think it's quite long, so you can pause it if you want to read it, but you see here it's, it mentions the DEX system. No DEX system should be without one. So I, I don't actually know, do you have any ideas how to continue through this game? The current version was translated from MDL into 4chan 4 yeah. by a somewhat paranoid um, DEC engineer who prefers to remain anonymous. All oh, right, so let's try help because I have no idea what to do. I think I can pause like this, but I think I've already missed the most important stuff. Can we go north or something? I, I've heard people do that. You're facing the north side of a white house. There is no door here. Go east? I don't know. Yeah, let's go east. One corner of the house. There's there a, is window. a window. Can Which we is ajar. open window? Let's see if that... With great effort, you open the window far enough to allow passage. Can I do this? <laughs> All right, we're in the kitchen now. That was easy. <laughs> Clear gas bottle is here. Can I drink it? One of the key things about this game in what I've looked into was that it was a bit more open to different commands. Mm, maybe. I don't know how it does it. I guess that was one of the reasons why it was written in Lisp originally. Um, it, it was commonly used at that time for artificial intelligence and nat natural language processing type applications like this. But, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to get any further in this game. Maybe we can just go north or something, but... Oh, there's a wall. <laughs> that's, that's good to know. This, um, this could take some time. Yeah, I, I probably won't bother, but... <laughs> what's next for the machine, then? What's next for the PDP-11, or what's next for your collection? What's... Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm still trying to get my, my Aurelio 2 drives, which is, you know, this 10 megabyte removable platter drive. Uh, they don't work. They sort of, they're getting there. Uh, there's definitely something wrong with them still. That's taken up my previous weekend and will probably take up the next few weekends as well. Um, but yeah, I, I just want these things to work. I think they're interesting machines and uh, it's a shame if they're just lying, you know, in a skip broken or something like that.